All right. Hey guys, uh, Tony Blower here. And, uh, I don't even know how to describe what I do. I do a lot of things. I teach self-defense to military law enforcement, uh, general public. And, uh, I study, uh, the psychology of fear and teach people how to manage fear in their life, both in, in, in business and in self-defense. And I just had a great talk with Chase on Everforward Radio. And I hope you enjoy it. What's up, everybody? We are back down here in Laguna Niguel. We got a repeat friend of the show, Mr. Tony Blauer, hopping on. Uh, you might know him from, uh, from Fuck Fear, No Fear, Spear System. What are we talking about today, my man? All of the above. <laughs> Stay tuned. Dropping soon. All of the above. Beautiful, man. Um, yeah, well. Let's do it. Tony, welcome, man. Welcome Did back we start? to the show. Yeah, well, am I not? Uh, <laughs> yeah, I, lately, I've just been kind of uh, just easing right easing into it. Easing in. When I, when I tried to structure... Exact intro, exact. To uh, contrived. Role. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. How many it. more times can I say exact? All right. But, um, thanks for coming up. Thank you, man. Yeah. Good to so, see you again. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, we first met last year, about a year and a half ago, uh, at the Fitness Business Summit 2018. Mm-hmm. Bedros Koulian and the whole gang. Let's bring this guy a little bit closer. Uh, there we go. Um, yeah, and uh, me and uh, the homie, Zach Rushlow, you guys invited us into your home, you and your beautiful wife, and we like, had a k- kitchen day, all like low-calorie cheeseburgers, pizzas, broccoli. It was uh, crazy. It was good. <laughs> and then we went in the garage and beat each other up. Exactly. Yeah, I got to be the dummy. Right. Um, literally. Yeah. I'm still suffering a little bit. Night. Little, right. <laughs> but how's life been over the past year or so, man? It's been crazy. It's been uh, a lot of travel, a lot of growth, um, and... Uh, uh, a, a lot more meditation, a lot more. It was, I, it was crazy. I, um, I turned 59 in May. Happy belated. Thank you. And so I'm working out yeah. and the phone rings. It's my mom, a middle of a workout. So I, I hit ignore and then I'm in between. I was a salt bike into some sort of transition and I'm in between sets. You've got that incredible at home work with Jim yeah, in your garage. It's crazy, yeah, right? Yeah. 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 And uh, so I say to myself, yeah, she did give birth to me. I should call her back, you know, like <laughs> after all. And so I call her back and she says, happy birthday. How's it feel to be 59? And I said, I'll let you know next year because I'm 58. And she says, uh, no, you're 59. <laughs> and uh, I did the math with her on the phone and I, I didn't, react well to it you legit thought you were 58 i legit thought i was 58 wow and then when i realized i was 59 i it gave me anxiety did you like freak out like, yeah where did just, this year go i was no it wasn't it wasn't that thing it was like i'm getting fucking old mm. i'm i'm ho- holy shit and i didn't my mom just turned 59 in august i could be your father <laughs> <laughs> okay this shows off i'm out of here uh yeah we're gonna need to cut we need right. to the uh quick dna test right um that would be awesome, by the way. But, uh, <laughs> son. Um, oh, yeah. Hello. Welcome, Bella, to the show. Hello. Yeah. Hello. She, she always makes new boyfriends whenever we have people over. Wow. Yeah. Quick She's cameo. The, yeah, little cameo. <laughs> Brought to you by... Um, yeah, so... <laughs> excuse me. It, no, it freaked me out. I didn't, I didn't like it. I didn't... My brain is still in my 20s, man. Mm-hmm. I... I you know, I still tease my kids like I'm their older brother. Yeah. I do stupid shit, you know, uh, and I just move slower than the 10, 20 year old, <laughs> but it's, I, I didn't like it. And I've, and I've been wrestling with it for on and off. Uh, yeah. cause I just go, oh, wait a minute. Like, I don't understand this whole dying thing and mm. getting old and I don't want the show to be a downer. Like everyone just shut the show. <laughs> okay. Ever wow, forward. Uh, let's <laughs> ever forward. Just stop. We're not going forward with this. How about no forward? <laughs> right. Um, yeah. So I've been this, this whole hourglass time is running out all this, you know, and I've done, I mean, I've traveled the whole world. I've mm. taught from Many times military over. to, women's shelters and everyone in between and, uh, you know, uh, d- 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 music, band, movies, stunt work, uh, like I have an incredibly, incredibly full a hell of a life resume. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I'm still like not satisfied. I'm still like, yeah. okay, this isn't, this isn't good enough. Which is wild to hear a man of your, like I said, life resume and experience and profession. Um, you said it freaked you out. I can't imagine a lot of things freak you out. Yeah, it will. Like I'm freaking out now, right? So like, <laughs> it, it, no. What I, 
it was it was one of these things where you know the word's a little dramatic but you know if you're lying there and and you're thinking about okay how many more days hours weeks months yeah. like you know how much time do i have to do this and there's so many things and it's crazy you know i did an exercise at a um a friend of mine retired military suggested i do called a look back where mm -hmm. you just write down all the things you can remember that in your life and i did this 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 thing i did it in evernote and then i'm trying to turn it into an article that can just uh, you know like lay that's a really a cool blog. concept i like that yeah. but it was just like because you don't remember all these stages and it, it was it was like you know how did i get here and i haven't done what i want to do and that's like oh my god yeah it's a really i've i i really wrestle with this uh daily gratitude practice i i i don't know if it was something my parents messed up mm. or i grew up in the 60s <laughs> or whatever it is but i just when i meet people that are like yeah. just say man i'm just so i'm grateful all the time i'm like like i'm fucking pissed all the time <laughs> and and i like secretly the hulk as well right yeah it just stays right? angry. It's like uh, right and but i it there's definitely a balance with it and i'm and i'm and i'm i'm not embellishing or being dramatic with this right now it's just i'm very i'm so passionate about life that i think i'm that passionate about not life you know yeah it's i think i understand what you're saying and i'm right there with you i i do try to practice gratitude i'm very grateful for every opportunity and every breath and everything in between but i'm with you once you really i think tap into your life source of this is my life's calling this is what i want to do or just honestly anything that really really interests you you, you get kind of pissed off that like you can't it's not always a given that you can always do that thing right you know and say like, wow i feel like i have so much more to like put out in the world i have so many more connections to make i have so many more things to give and create and, and you know it's just like you get pissed at time like there's not enough of it you know? it was interesting i was listening to uh jordan harbinger interviewing kobe mm -hmm. today on the yeah. way up and uh and jordan asked him about about drive and passion and 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 that intensity that he has and work-life balance he was going to use yeah. that terminology but but what kobe said was interesting he says like when you have it you can't you don't have a choice you can't really turn it off it's like it's like going on vacation. He used the example. You can go on a vacation and go, you know what? I'm not going to be on my phone. I'm not going to think about work. And then like two, three days later, you're like chomping at the bit. And I think it's just, you know, some people are just, they're possessed, obsessed with yeah. that stuff. And I, I was, I forget who I was talking to. Um, I was interviewed on another podcast where I used the term, I'm very passionate about this. And the person said, I don't think you're passionate. I think you're obsessed. Mm. And I was like obsessed as kind of a negative connotation. I was like, well, hold on a second. And I was getting ready to semantically defend obsessed versus yeah. passionate. And then I went, kind of split no. hairs over the definition. You know, but it, but it was like, no, wait a minute. Like if you wake up in the middle of the night thinking about the stuff you think about yeah. during the day, it's an obsession. It doesn't have to be a negative connotation. It's, it's uh, you know... Uh, Maybe I'm possessed instead of obsessed. Mm. But I feel like that sometimes too. Right? Yeah. Yeah. But it's but it's uh, like uh, it's not me steering the mind and the right. decisions. You're just channeling this. Exactly. I got it. Like you're, I got to drive this. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. Right. So uh, so yeah. So the but here here's an interesting thing. Really name dropping, right? Jordan, Kobe. Yeah. Uh, he I'm lives not, not that far from here. Right. Um, Tim Story was over recently, uh, and he's like, ah. I was driving through the neighborhood and I was like, I, th I think I've been to Kobe's house before. <laughs> I was like, like damn, right. I got to find like a star map of Laguna. <laughs> right. It's, it's a crazy area. Ed my let's right down the road, down at Laguna beach and all the crazy. Have shit. you met him? Uh, not in person. No, we yeah. kind of email DM back and forth a little bit, but nice. uh, he's, he's an interesting guy too. Yeah, I, mean, oh, I have not yeah. met him. Smart man. Yeah. Um, but, uh, I was up in LA and staying at a hotel there and I look over and uh, Gary Vaynerchuk is about to start a workout. Oh, no shit. So I'm like, you know, people love or hate him. Yeah. But the guy, I think, is a modern Zen master. I think he's a genius the oh, way yeah. he reframes it, how fast he looks at, at stuff. And, and uh, uh, you know, anyone who doesn't like him just doesn't like, and I shouldn't speak for people who are generalized, but doesn't like either his success or his energy or his output. The way and he challenges things. He right. challenges ideas and concepts. But I, 
I think he's a fucking genius. Mm -hmm. Anyways, I've met so many successful people. I don't have a problem walking up. And I'm very, I'm discreet about it. I mean, if it looked like yeah. uh, he was doing something important, I'm not going to interrupt. Excuse me. Yeah, and of course, <laughs> I'll repeat guest, friend of the show here. A lot of that backstory is in that original episode. I'll definitely link it down in the show notes. Okay, people cool. can really get a better understanding uh, and appreciation of you and your contributions to a lot of other people's successes and uh, safety. Absolutely. So, yeah, yeah this will be the, like part two. Yeah. Um, if no one wants to go listen to that, just I've been in the uh, uh, personal safety, uh, uh, combatives, defensive tactics, self-defense yeah. uh, space for 40 plus years. And and uh, and, not, and don't be humble about it. <laughs> like not to like to military organizations, yeah. To 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 actors, to celebrities, to to Business moms, to everyday yeah. people. Um, to I mean, to really to the human race, uh, a lot of people. That, well, that was my thing when I was twenty. I was asked by venture capitalists what I wanted to do. I was I was working with this uh, real estate mogul in Montreal where I used to live, and I was working with this kid and. and he comes up to me, he says, man, you do, you, he says, I studied martial arts. We did my little martial arts here and there. He says, what you're doing is so different. Yeah. I want to introduce you to somebody because I think there's something important here. And I was 20. had no idea what venture capital was. 1980. Like, you know, yeah. when he said, yeah, I got a VC friend. I'm like, what's VC? <laughs> did, did you mean VP? I knew what VP, yeah. right? And, uh, what other I, part of Canada are we in yeah, BC? <laughs> right. But I, but I, uh, went to this meeting and this, and this guy, Alan says to me, uh, so Lara, so, uh, so Rick says, you've got the, you know, the X factor, you know, what do you want to do kid? And I said, I want to make the world safer. Mm. And he looked at me and he said, he leans back in his, you know, big executive chair and he yeah. goes, you want to make the world safer? He says, you don't think that's a little grandiose? Mm. And I was like, why is that grandiose? It was, it was, uh, it was an interesting thing because like that's what keeps me up at night. I abhor violence. Hey, little cameo again. <laughs> Hello. Nella wasn't feeling safe, and so she needs right, to go to the right. protector. <laughs> Sit on the lap of the most dangerous person in the room. You Good. got some. You got some amazing dogs. She's probably picking up some. some oh yeah, some pretty wild got, sets right now. Yeah. So we got our, our four dogs. <laughs> Nella, on. come on. Um, she's okay. All right. Um, is, so he, he challenged like your life. I'm busy. Kind man. of call. Excuse me. I'm, I'm fucking no, like, busy. He was in the middle of like this releasing has to his, be the clip for the, This has to be the intro to the show. <laughs> I got to have some Nella bloopers apparently. Hello. Um, <laughs> she feels so, very safe with you. Yeah. So this is so funny. Her tail's wagging. <laughs> uh, put your headphones on. I want to talk to her. It's just, the, um, um, the, I'll get a little like doggy laugh. I'm like, <laughs> going her hardest. That's so cute. Um, the uh, I forget what I was talking about. So it was like your idea of making the world safer. Yeah, that's so that's too grandiose. That's always been yeah, nothing happened, you know, directly with him because it was like he couldn't wrap his head around that. It was like you know, if I had said I want to have a uh, you know uh, uh, an, uh, a, a rape whistle with mm. my logo on it, oh, I know who can do that. You know, yeah. it wasn't he didn't understand like how do you make the world safer? Yeah. And what I had what I had intuited in training the people I was training was that that we, people practice martial arts, they don't practice self-defense. And that mm. understanding self-defense was we needed uh, a, a deeper level of self-awareness to understand how physiology speaks to us. Every yeah. victim of violence who ever lived to tell the tale said they had a bad feeling yeah. before the attack. And that's so, why I love the premise of your entire philosophy and approach is all this, the startle flinch. It's, it's the, it's you don't the need science. to teach that. That's just paying attention it's, to it's the hard, body signal. And, yeah. it's, and it's hardwired around you. So if, you know, if I move towards you quickly yeah. and you felt danger, your hands are oh, moving. But you're, I immediately felt like this rush of just like... Right, right. And, and, uh, and, uh, and so we, we, we teach people how to weaponize physiology. Yeah. We teach people how to weaponize the startle flinch, how to, how to learn to read their intuition and their instincts. You know, I was saying that, that every victim of violence who lived to tell the tale said they had a bad feeling before the attack. Yeah, yeah. But nobody knows to do it, what to do with that. So when I started exploring that, I realized that, that most people suppress those uh, danger signals because of social conditioning, mm -hmm. right? So why are we suppressing danger signals and not exploring them? Well, I track that back to mm -hmm. a psychological, uh, um, a, a, like a, a, an oppressive relationship with fear. And so I started yeah. researching the psychology of fear instead of the biology of fear, where everyone talks about fight or flight. I went a completely uh, different direction, did so much research on it that I, I've lectured to, uh, you know, psychology departments at hospitals, wow. uh, human performance 
uh, uh, teams inside yeah. tier one military groups. So where that sensation is probably most prevalent all the time. Well, they need to like every every micro moment and every nano moment where you can improve human behavior yeah. in 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 death matches yeah. like that that time is critical like you know and so speed is everything in a violent encounter but understanding this intersection where like the neuroscience of fear i like to call it where you're understanding you know how to train how to stress inoculate and you know we're all down a, a completely different rabbit hole here but that's what i do so i consult around mm -hmm. the world but the you know the most fun stuff that I'm that I'm doing that I really want to focus on in in the, in the next year has to do with the shirt I made you wear, and yeah, and the no shirt fear. yeah the no the no fear K N O W yeah K N O W and it's uh, changing people's relationships with fear and I really believe that it, in my life like I grew up afraid of everything I was a really good athlete competed in everything that I did but I never podiumed in anything because I was I was just so afraid of the failure i was afraid yeah. of am i really as good as people say if i'm you know and i remember thinking if i'm so good why am i so scared and i think that that's, a, that's an amazing point right there it's not to cut you off um but like i really hope the listener hears that and it's not so much just the typical definition of fear i'm walking down a dark alley late at night and i am afraid i might get robbed or that kind of typical fear yeah and let me the fear let me, comes from a lot of emotions let me reciprocate here with with the with the injection here is that that most of the the fear um management for lack of a better term advice you get online fear culture yeah is is a um it's it's almost like a fortune cookie level mm. not and this isn't to put and there's like great people talking about fear uh but they don't give us a map an internal map that that we can now take. So we have things like one of the greatest, uh, 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 you know, quotes, Customato who trained Tyson said the difference between the hero and the coward is what they do with their fear. Yeah. Implying yeah, they yeah. both feel it. Yeah. Well, you can look at that and you can post that up on your gym. You can tattoo that on your arm and, but it doesn't teach you to change your relationship. Yeah. What it are just, the applications? Yeah. Just, yeah. it's not, it's not an actionable quote. It yeah. just reminds you going in. And so now it's kamikaze. It's like, ah, yeah, fear, yeah. you know, like, uh, and so you can, you know, <laughs> like, congratulations. Did, did you, did, you're afraid. Did you do? And, and, but that's part of it is just accepting it. Mm -hmm. Right. So mm -hmm. that, that can change things, but I wanted to go deeper. I, I wanted to, it's almost like it's, 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 it's the equivalent of you and I go for a hike and we get lost yeah. And we go, you know, there's bobcats and bears and we're out of water and we're out of food and, and there's bad weather coming in. And then you go, we're going to fucking die. Yeah. And I go, no, we're not. And I go, the difference between the hero and the coward is what they do with their fear. And you go like, we're going to fucking die. We have no water. Yeah. But other people are afraid to like, yeah. like it's not an actionable thing. Right. Right. Um, and so the metaphor here is we can be both characters, right? It's the, like, i you know, I'm going to crush it today. And then you, you're on your way to this meeting and then there's an accident on the highway yeah. and you're traffic and you're going to miss the meeting. And now you're like freaking out. Right. And, and, and stupid example, but suddenly we go like this uh, Jekyll and Hyde. Yeah. A very real conversation. A lot of people right, the, the theater in the mind. And so what I find, and I, and you know, I look at uh, like everything when something about fear comes up, uh, it's mostly, people talking about an aftermath so it's an after action report mm -hmm. this is what we notice dan millman who wrote the uh, the way the peaceful warrior mm -hmm. and a bunch of other books but he said when you face just one opponent and you doubt yourself you're outnumbered <laughs> it's one of my favorite wow. quotes right wow. so when we're teaching when we teach our be your own bodyguard course and we're and we're and we're we're doing this course and we, and we teach self-defense with the same efficiency as ems teaches cpr yeah right so you know you can you I tell people, you can learn to defend yourself in a day. Now, every martial art artist in the world, not every, because we've got hundreds of martial artists, thousands that train with us. But most of them will go, that's bullshit. That sounds like a scam because I've been training for five years or 10 years. I'm still learning. Right. You can't learn in a day. Like it's a lifelong process. I'm sure what They're confusing do. learning a martial art with learning how to defend yourself, mm. which, okay. which are completely different. So you can learn in the equivalent example parallel example is you can learn cpr tactical first aid you can learn how to put on a tourniquet 
yeah. in a matter of hours yeah. and have life-saving skills, but that doesn't make you a fucking doctor. Yeah, exactly. Right? And so the martial artist is like the doctor. And imagine, and I tell people- like, It's a lifelong practice. Yeah, and, yeah. and it's, it's, it's like doing a thruster and versus learning how to do you know, Olympic lifting. Yeah. Olympic lifting, you, you study for years, you're still always going to work on your snatch and your clean. And it, you all the technique-oriented yeah. follow-up right. work, yeah. But you can still get a workout. And so, so I don't, I don't want to- I don't, I don't wanna, spend too much time on that just for listeners to go what did you did he just say you can learn to finish yourself in a day yes detect diffuse defend understanding intuition understanding choice speech how to de-escalate things learning cord extremity gross motor explosive movement based off of weaponizing a startle flinch when yeah. someone goes to move at you in your hand whoa take it easy you you're now coiled and locked and loaded mm -hmm. for the most explosive movement you can do there's like double double palm eye gouge grab the head and the most important thing is the your opponent doesn't expect you to move yeah, from there. Exactly, and, yeah. and, they, and so They're there's probably like, counting on you not. <laughs> well, well, yeah. but that's why they picked you. And we can go like, you know, I didn't want this to be a self-defense course, but you know, we're, I, I, I like to use stories and metaphors, but mm. you've got like a, like a, a handyman, a carpenter and, and an architect. And if you don't even know what a handyman, a carpenter and an architect is, if I said to you, which one sounds more educated and smarter and understands more, you could probably guess that architect, does because it's a big fucking word and yeah. you can't spell it you can get a degree in right it. <laughs> right so so but you know a, a, a handyman can fix a couple of things mm. um a carpenter understands more about shit but the architect understands the big picture and so when we train people we try to give them this architectural perspective what does the bad guy want what's the psychology bad yeah, guy yeah. what happens to you what are you thinking as the intended victim how does that change your physiology how does that impact your breathing how does that change your understanding state? each person's role really and, and yeah. it's well it's understanding your role the predator prey right right but it's but it's also understanding a the the in a very quick uh uh literally it's a 90 minute lecture we give you kind of like the equivalent of, of an armor's course for a weapon. We say, you're the human weapon. So mm -hmm. I tell somebody, you know, you shoot. A lot of people don't shoot. But you go to the range and you shoot. If you do an armor's course, which doesn't involve any shooting, it's taking apart the gun, it's understanding how it works. Right. Yeah. I tell people that when you complete an armor's course, you're actually a better shooter because you've demystified the fear of the mechanics. Absolutely. Yeah. And so what we do in our the course, unknown. yeah, we, we, we say this is the, this is the mental blueprint for violence. This is predator prey interaction. These are the rules. This yeah. is what happens as a psychology of attacker. This is you, this is physiology. This is physics. This is psychology. So there's a scientific approach. And when you understand that you demystify the violence, it doesn't take away the risk. One of my favorite memes you know, I, I, I wrote it a few years ago and been pumping around the internet is when shit happens is violence doesn't care what martial art you study, <laughs> right? Violence yeah. doesn't care if you're Republican or Democrat. Yeah. It just, so are you prepared when it happens? And that's your responsibility. And we spell responsibility with a hyphen responsibility, mm -hmm. i.e. your ability oh, to yeah, respond. Yeah, I like that. But it all comes back like to that. this. Yeah. If you don't change your relationship with fear, if you don't change your relationship with fear, it doesn't matter. It doesn't, it doesn't matter, you know, what you do. And there's, there's several stories of, of high level world champion, uh, uh, fighters who have been seriously injured and killed, uh, in real street violence yeah. because yeah. they mistakenly just assume that their, their physical, their complex motor skills, their ability to fuck people up in an octagon or a ring or whatever could be just transferred to street violence with an asocial predator. Mm. And the asocial predator wouldn't last uh, 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 like 30 seconds in a contest with that individual. Yeah. But on when, their turf. Yeah, but when they were sitting in a car with a gun shooting through the door, you know, yeah. like, like that world class. There's no like gloves coming together and then you all yeah, agree how you're going to fight. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So it, it, it totally changed. So that was, a, that was a crazy rant. We just went down. No, no I, I love it. And I, um, again, I'll kind of go back to what I was saying before of how I hope the person listening, watching really pays attention to how you're really describing how you help people and how you have really yourself come to understand fear. And it's not just the typical definition, the typical experience. Um, and I, I, I can totally relate. Uh, speaking of storytelling and everything, a lot of my work recently, as I've been tr really trying to better understand myself and to get better at this craft of talking with people, I've realized that it truly is just, yeah, of course, do your homework, know the person a little bit to hold a conversation, but just 
the art of telling a story. Mm-hmm. And all right, well, if I'm an asset of my guests, if I'm an asset of this other person I'm interacting with, you know, let's say you're going to a meeting or meeting someone for coffee or at work or whatever, you, you need to kind of understand the art of weaving in a story. And in order to do that, I think you need to better understand yourself and your story so that you know where and how to kind of pull those things out. And diving into my story, a lot of scary shit mm. came up. Fear of, you know, like fears of, of abandonment, fears of, you know, uh, of money, lack of money, fears of a lot of these like emotional tie-ins to significant benchmarks in my life. And that's where I may be, you know, really reaching here. But I think when people don't face the the emotional, spiritual, even, you know, physical traumas, uh, that we associate fear to in, a, in our life um, that always kind of puts us in the guard for those situations in real life. So then actual emotional, spiritual fears turn into real physical fears because we're not prepared. We don't mm-hmm. understand what we've gone through. We don't understand how to work through it and have a better relationship with it, like you're saying, so that when, if and when it presents itself in real life, we're prepared. Uh, I think a lot of people probably don't realize that, that a real life physical danger of you know, having fear can come from, again, it might be reaching here, but just your lack of ability to renegotiate that relationship with an emotional fear kind of thing. Well, that's, that's kind of what the shirt is about. And it started about 20 years ago up in Montreal, Canada, where I used to live, uh, where it was written on a whiteboard, no fear without the K and the W yeah. where I was talking about, cause I've always, I've always woven into the fear and I want to try and get back to what you were trying to I think I know what I was trying there. to say there. Well, I hope no, it conveyed. I, 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 <laughs> fear manifests itself in a lot of different ways. Yeah. And, and so, and that's why I say like the, that fear throttles everything we do in our life and it, and it, yes. it impacts yeah. It impacts who you talk to, therefore who we marry. Yeah. It impacts how much money you make, where you live, uh, how much weight you lift, whether or not you defend yourself. But what I figured out how to do, uh, it's almost killing two birds with one stone, is I would argue that the, the ability to protect yourself or a loved one is inarguably the most important skill you could mm. possess. Yeah. Now, people would want to argue with that, but it's fear that's making the argument because they don't want to accept. Mm. If you think about this, you know, whatever material wealth we have, if somebody said, hey, guess what? You know, the most important per- person in your life is going to be taken away from you in a violent encounter. And you get, but you get to keep your car collection, your stamp mm-hmm. collection, your guitar collection, your watches. You'd be like, are you fucking kidding me? No, yeah. uh, you know, my wife, my kid, my husband, forget that. You know, so you know, I, was, I was joke like, unless you're a thief who stole their success, mm-hmm. you want your relationships. The, mm-hmm. the external successes you can reacquire through hard work and, and rebuild, yeah. you know, in 2010, I lost, I, I'd spent 20 years building a, a, a company. And when the, um, military sequestration happened, I had a morally and ethically corrupt COO who did a deal with somebody else. I lost over three days, my $12 million company with oh 12 gosh. staff, 20,000 foot facility, octagon fight. I house. remember this from my last conversation. Was yeah. this the, Virginia Beach? Yeah. That's right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, so I, I went from, you know, the CEO of this $12 million company on Friday to dissolving it within a couple of weeks and having like zero revenue and having three people I mentored wow. think, well, this is it. Tony's done. Wow. And they went off and, and, you know, contacted my, like set up their own companies and started going after my, all of my contacts. I mean, horrifying betrayal, craziness. Um, how did you handle that? It, it, indignation, anger as a fuel. Uh, but it was, you know, using the system to keep my shit together. I mean, it took me, year look, took over five years to rebuild uh you had to really take a dose of your own medicine to kind of go back to your own teachings was, in a way but it, but it was it was it was crazy because i realized and and i've actually um spoken at some uh interesting entrepreneur and business conferences about this where uh 
I get I get called to do speaking at a at a company, yeah. and they want me to talk about uh, whether expatriates talk about situational awareness and traveling, or hey, can you come and talk about you know f- uh, you know some self defense and and blah blah blah. And I go, how about I talk about how a a one of the world's I hate talking about myself in the sense best known, <laughs> you know, I mean, self defense combatives yeah, guys, very sought after, you know, expert, yeah. um, had his company stolen from him because he didn't apply detective fuse defend mm. the same skills that i teach people in the street mm-hmm. i didn't apply that in my company where i saw pre-contact cue but cognitive dissonance shuts that down i go they wouldn't do that to me the name of the company's blower tactical why would they you know blah 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 Damn. but that's a whole other maybe yeah. uh, uh, uh show on yeah. on on the business but i want yeah. to get back to the the fear aspect here is so like 20, 30 years ago in Montreal, writing on the whiteboard, I, I started doing this joke. It's every, everything we, everything that we teach is always framed or cocooned or positioned around understanding fear. Right. And yeah. I tell people that, you know, if you're scared, shitless, unconscious or dead, you're not going to do your next move. If fear, uh, you know, you can have, I can say, okay, here's the plan to take your business, scale your business 10 X. If you're sitting there, hesitating it's fear and i tell people well a stimulus gets introduced too quickly and that creates a moment of doubt doubt unchecked becomes hesitation Mm -hmm. doubt and hesitation Mm -hmm. unchecked becomes a fixation that fixation can turn into anxiety and that can become a panic attack for some people depending on what the circumstance is or it's just hey did you ever do that thing you told me you were going to do remember you told me you're going to quit your job and start that now you know what uh you know the security of the company was just too good and i didn't want to move and no 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 when you peel the fucking onion of all those stories it comes down to fear so we come back to what we were talking about a half an hour ago (laughs) is we have all of these posters and zen fortune cookies and memes about fear but nobody created a map yeah and i did and i and i i i built a map that was based on a conversation this is actually in like the the mid to late 80s and i was listening to an interview with this guy named howard gardner who's a famous social scientist he's written a bunch of books but the book he was talking about on on some talk radio um, it was called Frames of Mind, and it was I think he was talking about the different types of geniuses and people, math geniuses, sports geniuses, mm. and stuff like this. And he said, "Look, I've I've studied all these thousands of people, and he the the, the phrase that kind of blew my mind and set me off on this path was, he said he believed that eighty percent of an individual's motivation was derived from their expectation." Wow, can you say that again? Yeah, eighty percent. Eighty percent of an individual's expectations are derived from their. Uh, in, uh, sorry, eighty <laughs> percent of an individual's motivation yeah. is derived from their expectations. I believe it. And yeah. and I uh, went back to my office. Again, it was like eighty six, eighty seven. How old, when were you born? Eighty five. Beautiful. Yeah. I, my know. birthday's in a couple of weeks. Right. So happy birthday. Yeah, so you're you. like a year old, <laughs> year old at the time. And, and I sat down and there was no whiteboard and there's no computer, you know, per se. Yeah. It was a blotter on my desk and I wrote down motivation, expectation, 80, 20. And I stared at it and I said, that sounds true. I'm not going to be motivated to do something if my expectation mm-hmm. isn't more, if it's 51, 49, maybe I sit there staring at it. If I drink this, I'll quench my thirst, but it could be poison, so I could die. But it looks like water, but maybe it's poison. Like, I'm, I'm going to hesitate, right? A funny time, actually, speaking of uh, earlier, talking about Gary Vaynerchuk, right. I just saw recently, I think it was his Instagram post yesterday. He, he said his number one tip for success, like, how do you be successful? He was like, get rid of all expectations. Mm-hmm. Just forget like any expectation of people, of things, of projects. I just, yeah. I, just uh, I didn't, I've seen him talk about that before, but I just, uh, reposted a meme on a page uh, about, about that you know and it was like so true but so hard to do it's yeah. impossible you know to come up here and go you know uh, i want to i want to motivate and inspire people i want to be i want to be on i want people to yeah. to like my message and 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 then but have no expectations you know no like you know 
hey, I hope the show with Tony's good. I hope he brings his fire, you know, whatever. Yeah. You know, that's an expectation. I think it's easier said to to work on, to lower or even eliminate expectations that you think others have of you. It's another thing, again, maybe just speaking personally, to completely abandon expectations for yourself. Right. I, I, again, speaking for myself, I'm someone who especially over the years have really, I, I've grown my expectation of myself in terms right. of the quality and the consistency. I think, I think he's referring I to other people. I agree. Yeah. You know, I think he's talking about like, but you that's know, like step one, working on expectations, eliminating them, expectations of others. Right. Step two is, all right, maybe you square that away. Now it's like, shit, what are my own expectations of myself and how do I define success? And yeah. what happens if I don't even meet that expectation? Yeah. That'd be an interesting one because that's, that's, that's really what drives you. You yeah, know, like yeah. you, you know, so I don't, I don't even know that you want to mess with that. You don't become going back to, you know, the Kobe Bryant's talk and everything. You don't become Kobe Bryant if you change your expectations, yeah. you know, everyone else can go, Hey, he's really good. He's drafted. If he's, if in his mind, if they're going, you really think you're going to do well on the Lakers mm. and, and he's going, I'm, I'm going to win six championships, motherfucker. Mm -hmm. And they're going like, dude, you haven't even played one year. We're going to like, <laughs> right. But it's yeah. his expectations are what made him practice yeah. more than anyone else. Same with Gretzky, same with Sugar Ray Leonard, same with the Beatles, same with the people that do their, everyone else is, is thinking like when the 10,000 hour metaphor yeah. came out, yeah. you know, there's going to be an app going, Hey, 10,000 hours where I'm going, I've been doing this for 40 years. That's how many times 10,000 hours that, yeah. you know, that's 10 years. And I'm like, like the people that are doing that aren't trying to get 10,000 hours. And it's not like they hit that 10,000 hours mark and you're like, boom, okay, cool. Like now I've reached success or now I'm well, an but expert. The, but, the, but that's the, the thing is, you know, one of the maxims I throw at people, I say, you'll never know how much you can do until you try to do more than you can. Yeah. But it's the, it's the Roger Bannister effect It's like, you'll never break four minute mile. And then he does it. And then within two weeks, 14 people yeah. do it and now yeah. and now if you can't run a four minute mile you can't you're not competing the human potential never ceases to blow right. my mind yeah. we i think a lot of times especially with that four minute mile benchmark we just need there needs to be someone to to decide that they're going to do it first right and then once that happens that completely breaks but all the of this comes down to fear this is the yeah, mad, this yeah, is yeah. the magic of that is like someone says you need ten thousand hours and that becomes yeah. the goal line or the target but now you're not you're, I would argue that you're actually not even working on your craft completely because you're trying to accumulate something right. to go, oh, look, I got a diploma that says I did 10,000 hours, so I'm a fucking master, so pay me this much or give me this job or, mm -hmm. you know, whatever. But, you know, the, the you, you remember the No Fear Company? They're, yeah, st they're yeah, still around. Yeah. Adrenaline Company, you know, uh, uh, you know, I think uh, they made the mark in motorbike extreme sports. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So I used to buy all the shirts because it was a really cool logo. So I'd wear them all the time. And I was wearing it like when I was teaching. I go like, I got this shirt here, but I still have fear, which means this shirt's printing is defective. And everyone would laugh, right? Because it'd be like part of my, like, you know, I'm like the stand-up comic self-defense <laughs> expert, right? Yeah. You know, I, um, but I'd use it to make a joke. And I'd say, no fear. We all want to have that. But the idea that you're thinking that you want to have no fear actually amplifies the derogatory relationship yes. with fear yeah, yeah do you understand that yeah. right do you guys understand yeah. that it's, it's it's like it's like if i go okay i've trained and trained and trained and the ultimate state of this next jiu-jitsu competition this next public speaking event this next business presentation is if i've really got my shit together i yeah. will be in the zone with no fear and the idea that you would get to no fear perpetuates more fear for many people there are anomalies but we can't you know, a lot of times when, when people are studying flow and zone, yeah. they're using like an outlier, mm. which yeah, I think, yeah, which exactly. I think is dangerous. Yeah. Most the human race, we're not outliers. Like most of us are yeah. just a man. I, I just want to freaking work hard today and get yeah. home and see my family and honest days work for an honest yeah. day, you which know, is most people definitely right? here right? in my audience for sure. Right. Yeah. You know, so, so, but even, but even if you're like an alpha male, high, high, uh, you know, and, and you could be alpha female, not, you know, categorizing alpha human, alpha human, yeah. and you're trying to get shit done. You have fucking fear. And you may be like, I, I might've told this to you first time, but I, I love sharing the story, uh, down at Fort Bragg, working with one of the tier one groups that, that was down there, got the, got there a couple of days early, meeting at a Starbucks, me and three of the other guys. 
The guy says, hey, do you want to go jumping? Hmm. And I know what he means. He means skydiving, yeah. right? So I go jumping, like up and down, and they giggle. They go, no, nah, come on, man. And I said, uh, no, I'm good. Yeah. They go, like, aren't you like the fear management expert, the fear management expert with air quotes? And I go, uh, yeah, I'm managing my fear by not jumping out of the airplane. Pretty good, right? So they all laugh. And uh, I say, you know, here's the thing. I've done it. I've done it twice. I do not like heights. Fear management was me jumping out of an airplane afraid of heights. Mm-hmm. I said, you aren't afraid of heights. I go, you love skydiving, right? And he's like, yeah. He says, I fucking go whenever I can. I said, so you don't have any fear of it. That's not a big deal. Yeah. There's nothing to manage. Right. And so I need people to understand this, that you can't be brave if you're not afraid. <coughs> you can't be brave if you're not afraid. And it's a, it's a great line to remember because a lot of us don't want to, we want to be brave, but we don't want to be afraid. Mm-hmm. And so it's like a conflict unless you get to know fear. Yeah. And so that's part of this program. So we have a whole other program that has nothing to do with physical fighting. Although I will tell people this, and it has been my passion for uh, four decades, that you can learn how to protect yourself and simultaneously get an, like a armorer's view of the neuroscience of yeah. fear. Yeah. And now you've got this skill, God forbid, some sudden violence in your life appears you've got this this skill set that could enhance your survivability, yeah. right? But every day we're faced with some sort of fear-based stimulus. I'm late for a meeting. I got a problem with one of my kids. I, you know, I know, I know people who are, you know, jump out of an airplane, run towards gunfire, but can't say, I'm sorry, can't say, I love you, yeah. can't public speak. I mean, I've, had, I've been in classes like with, with the most badass people where I say to them, okay, does anyone have a question? Yeah. Any questions? No, such thing as a stupid question. Any questions? And they're like, okay, guys, let's take a break. And then three guys come up to me and they go, yeah. hey, man, I got a question. Yeah. I go, I just said, <laughs> like, where the hell were you? Like, they go down and want to, like, but yeah. what it is is if you peel the onion, they don't like public speaking. They yeah. want to talk privately. And that, they don't want to look, or no, sound stupid. You know what the number one fear is in the world? Yeah. Public fucking speaking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Not fear of sharks, not getting dragged to a secondary crime scene and tortured. Right. And if I said to you, like, okay, you're going to get uh, uh, raped and murdered, or you have to get on stage and do wow. a speech, everyone would pick the speech. Right. So we, we block out these, these, these other things. But what I realized in, because it's been 30 years over that I've intentionally been studying fear, but fear management from the psychology point of view. And I, I created a fucking strip map for the mind mm-hmm. that says, you're over here. And these are your beliefs and this is what you're thinking about. And that's put you in the fear loop and you need to get over here. So if I go back to that, that example of you and I are lost in the woods and you're panicking and I'm like going, ah, fuck. And I'm like reading fortune. Dan Millman said the difference between Customato said, and you're like, we're fucking lost. Stop reading quotes. Okay. We're here. (laughs) How do we get here? We need a strip map. But the, the, the actual due North of how do I get out of here? You got to get out of the fear loop before you can start moving because until your brain says do this you know like nothing happens so the the, probably the most exciting thing that i'm working on now is a uh is more of a for lack of a better term a corporate program Mm -hmm. uh called no fear and it's about changing our relationship with fear and how that applies whether you're a salesperson whether you're a mom dad whether you're a CEO, whether you're, you're you're running a gym, whether if you're a human being, if you have yeah, fear popping up some way, shape, or if form you're a life. human, I was, uh, yeah. do you know Andrew Huberman from Huberman Lab? He's a no, neuroscientist, so. does a lot of stuff with Brian McKenzie, and oh, okay, and, uh, okay. But he and I were chatting online. I had him on my on my show. Uh, it was a very fascinating show. You know, talking to a neuroscientist. He's an interesting guy because he grew up in the streets. He was a Thai boxer, and so it's you don't. A lot of times, you don't get academics who've also been into street fights mm-hmm. who can talk about fear. Right? Like you got a guy in a lab coat who's <laughs> telling you about fear and all that. You're yeah. going, oh, I could beat you up. Like, <laughs> like, but, like here's a big guy who's like yeah. you know been punched in the face and punched people, and so but also studied the brain and the mind and all this shit. And he's actually an actual a real life neuroscientist, and. Uh, and we were talking about a new study that came out where they found, uh, you know, you know, some sort of, I don't know if it's an enzyme or neurotransmitter or something in the bones. That, and they were talking in this that oh, re- discovering some kind of like physiological, yeah, correlation. some sort of thing that 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 oh, changes wow. how we respond to danger and fear and and their suggestions that and, and they used 
they said, look, you know, they're saying that this is actually happening before adrenaline kicks in. Hmm. And uh, so people, like, I, as soon as people start talking about fear and adrenaline and shit like that, I yeah. like I open my inbox and there's people going, Tony, have you seen this? Tony, have you seen this? And, yeah. you know, uh, so I read it really quickly and I go, and no offense, I'm just being facetious when sure. I do this. I'm like this. I go, <laughs> <laughs> and And it's not, these people are way smarter than me. Yeah. But what I do is I go like this, like something that happens at the sub, 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 subconscious level where somebody's measured that something in your bone system secretes some sort of stimulus that, that uh, uh, precedes the adrenaline release and the amygdala. Like, I go, that's so irrelevant to all of us because we can't fucking understand it or see it. Can't fathom that. And, but, but, but it could be explained to us, but, but if, if suddenly the ceiling started to fall in, I wouldn't go, oh, I need that enzyme or that, that, <laughs> that, that, that neurotransmitter to come on body, write, excrete enzymes. Right. It's like, you know, and <laughs> might I, excrete something and else. In exactly. A situation. And you know, I'm using the wrong terminology. <laughs> I didn't, I didn't study, but, but it, you know, so I'm texting with Andrew and I go, and one of the things they're saying when, when one of their, their premises was, Hey, look, there are, are a few uh, animals that we studied that don't actually have adrenal glands. Mm. So they still have a fight or flight syndrome but they don't have adrenal glands, so it's not adrenaline. Right, yeah, what's that about? Yeah. Right? So I, I text back to him, I go, yeah, but the people reading the article do have adrenal glands, and that's all that matters, right? Yeah. Do you understand what I'm, where I'm going with that? It's like, yeah, like yeah. the animals without the adrenal glands are not reading this. Yeah. And, and so I look at things in such a, uh, 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 like, a like a spontaneous, like, fucking like right in there like does this does this information enhance my survivability mm. or does it complicate what i'm thinking about like can yeah. i can i actually do it? and that's why when people were talking about fight or flight and all of that guy go those that language and that research is only valuable after the event yeah yeah exactly like yeah. in the moment yeah. when you're getting chased by a saber tooth tiger you're not going I should be flighting right now, right? <laughs> now, should I be fighting or flighting? Yeah, like, while you're inside I'm the right, saber tooth tiger, like, right, you know, in retrospect. I should have, right. <laughs> yeah. And so what I want, what I realize is, is I don't want to be just, you know, uh, like a, a, a statistic, t you know, that supports the research. I need to influence the outcome of this. Yes. How do I yeah. do this? Right. Well, you're not supposed to win, or you're not supposed to survive, or you're not supposed to, you know, be that outlier. That well, all of that. Every time I'd ask why and what and how, when it would come down to it, it was about my relationship with fear. So here I'm at Fort Bragg with a skydiving story. Shout out eighty second airborne. Right? And I no, it wasn't it wasn't those was guys. No. no, and I can't tell you who it was. Okay, all right. but but <laughs> they're there too. <laughs> they're uh, and so. Um, I'm there and the guy says, you're afraid. And I go, yeah, I'm managing my fear. Ha ha ha. By not going. And I said, do you have no fear? He goes, no. He says, I skydive all the weekend. And I say, Hey, you can't be brave if you're not afraid. So I know guys that don't like jumping out of airplanes, but to maintain their qualification and stay on yeah, this oh, yeah. team, they got to jump. Wings, yeah. Right. And so I looked at him and I said, no fear. He goes, no. I said, let me pack your shoot for you. <laughs> and he looks at me and I go and I look at him and I go and I have no fucking idea oh, what I'm wow. doing and he looks at me and he goes fuck <laughs> you and I go that's fear yeah. in other words I could introduce fear by changing his ritual one variable one variable yeah. I go hey man you're, you're, you're good to go just yeah. fucking jump he's like no well why are you hesitating mm -hmm. why is there doubt yeah why is there you know and if I say you can't look at it go up there just trust Wow. Right? Yeah. Like he might be up there like this, sitting there, and now he's like, his shake's shaking. And dude, why are you so nervous? I've never seen nervous before. Yeah, jump. you're on your like your 300th jump. Yeah. yeah. And he's like, well, Blower Pack won't shoot. You <laughs> know, I think, he, yeah, I, think he, I think he did something. Do I even have a shoot in there? Right? And so, no, it's a pillowcase. Fuck. You know, it's oh, like, yeah. you know what I'm saying is like, so you can change yeah. that. And here's the other thing is like, we all develop rituals, pre event rituals that calm us down. And so sometimes how we look at fear is just semantics, mm -hmm. you know? But my big thing is this. I really believe that if we taught kids how to look at fear and how to talk about fear and how to manage fear, that people would self-actualize at a different rate and that yeah. would make the world a better place. Right? I agree. And 
Couldn't agree more with that. Um, one thing is keeps kind of coming back to mind with me. Something you said earlier about being, being brave in the face of fear. Um, mm -hmm. I forget exactly what you said, but it reminded me of, well, sometimes we don't need to be brave for ourselves. Mm. So let's, let's take, you know, all the things you've been saying, I think are great tools and applications that we can make, uh, you know, our daily living better or personal life, professional, or getting rid of fear to take action on the thing that we've been waiting to do for so long. But sometimes it's not about us and we need to be brave for someone else right. who can't. And that rings true for, you know, a lot of my military background, but something, honestly, the most afraid I've ever been. My biggest fear factor um, was really the whole premise that I had to face in order to do what we're doing right now, mm -hmm. um, facing that loss of my father. And I have diagnosed PTSD from my time in the military and dealing with my father and his terminal illness. And for years, I couldn't even watch a movie where somebody would die or, mm -hmm. or be in a hospital because I would get triggered. I would have panic attacks and I became unsafe in a lot of situations. And I finally overcame that. I, I would say I finally got to the point to where I could be in the same room with fear and not mm -hmm. let it take control. I had to be brave for, for my wife and her family. About two years ago now, the, her grandfather became very, very ill. He, was, he had a series of like strokes and cardiovascular issues, and he was on his way out for a while, but it was his end of days. And um, going into the hospital, visiting him for a few times I had to leave. It kept coming back, mm -hmm. kept coming back. I literally had to force myself to go into the most fearful situation because when I would walk back into that hospice center and be in that you know bedside with my, sure. my family, True, it's, I was thing. staring at my father again. And, uh, it, and it took me just like, all right, Chase, you have to be comfortable with fear. You can't let it keep forcing you out of the room, literally. And when he passed, um, I was the only one who physically was capable and emotionally stable enough to, to handle a lot of the things mm. that were going on and to be there and supportive of my, my wife and my family and in the same room with the deceased. Mm -hmm. When that happened with my father, I, I went into the room and had to immediately leave. And so it took me coming face to face with my personal biggest fear to finally be able to get comfortable with it. Not so that I could be brave for myself, but brave and present for the people that matter most to me. The... the um the uh, power, very powerful story in it, in it, it not only resonates with something we talk about in, in the course, um, but it's just, it's another example of an interesting psychology. And that is, there are a lot of things that we see that needs to happen. Mm outside of ourselves mm -hmm. that we can't apply to ourselves. Um, yeah. If you were standing on the sidewalk and you saw somebody walking across the street, texting slowly, and you heard a car, you, you're standing on the sidewalk and you see this and you, your brain immediately triangulates trajectory yeah. and speed. And you're like screaming, look out, look out, look. And the person's like, and they look up and they're deer in the headlights and they start a flinch and they freeze and they get hit. Yeah. Everyone on the sidewalk knew it was going to happen, but that person, when when you said look out, and they looked up, they knew it was going to happen too, but yeah. they were mobilized by fear there, and they yeah. couldn't they couldn't move. And you think, well, that's the person that needs to use fear the most, right there, right? Yeah. And and so the 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 psychology I'm talking about is this like bodyguard kind of uh, principle that we share that it's easier when it's not happening to you. Oh, of course, yeah, right. And, and so part of it was that, you know, with your dad, y y your, your brain didn't think it at this level, but you don't get better at anything in life without doing reps. Mm -hmm. And that's like a rep that you don't want a bunch of reps of, mm -hmm. right? But this is the second time you had to d deal with that, not your first time. Yeah. Um, uh, augment the, the courage that you needed, but the fact that you had to be strong for your wife who you loved and cared about and her family who, yeah. who you cared about. But what your brain was calculating was, hey, this sucks, but you got through it once before. He might not have been articulating that. Yeah, but, but also because like the last time this happened, I, I didn't make it through. I, I literally spent about a decade just 
stuffing right. stuff down, dealing with the, the trauma right. and the PTSD and the panic attacks. And so, my, of course, my brain is going to go, hey, right. idiot, last time this happened, it was right. 10 years okay. and you were, you were shitty. <laughs> right. You know, you, your mental health wasn't stable. A lot of other things weren't stable. Right. So, of course, it's going to protect well, itself. It was, without getting too deep in, into all that, was was the PTSD and panic attacks uh, solely specific to your dad passing? Or, or were there other, other elements in... Um, I mean, it, it, definitely a lot of things that I experienced in the military, I was one of the few that, you know, made it out, you know, with my life and all limbs and stuff. And I, my, myself, I'll never, I was never in like direct line of firefight, but a lot of the work that I did, <clears throat> excuse me, a lot of the work that I did directly contributed to and was, you know, lives were on the line. Mm-hmm. And so it, it's, I think dealing with very, very specific, um, high profile decisions, Mm-hmm. Of like me deciding to be there or not, me deciding to like say to this team, "Hey, go left or go right," or like the the guys in the building or not, kind of thing. Uh, or we receive this form of intelligence, you know. Also, advising the people around me. So when it came down to like needing to make a decision of, mm-hmm. All right, "Hey, baby, like do this, go there," like I'll fill in the spot, or you take the next shift. It really came down to those decision making processes. That again, I knew if I do this one thing wrong, you know, right. someone else could die. Right. Uh, and then also literally in the room with that same experience of deciding to be in the room, deciding to go back and visit my family and just life or death decisions yeah. um, were, were always a part of my life. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, it, it all like, like for me uh, comes down to like orientation and, and, you know, you could have like all the kit and everything like that, but if you but if you're dropped into using a military metaphor here, you're yeah. dropped in some place and you have zero land nav skills. Yeah. It doesn't matter that you were the best trained and the best. You know, you were selected to go do this lone right. operator yeah. mission. They drop you in. And they go. They didn't, I forgot to tell them that I failed land nav. <laughs> like you know, like I'm you know, and so you end up yeah. just like like sitting right there, and and the mission gets blown, and then you eventually die because you're yeah. fucking stuck. Um, Which oddly enough, not to derail, like. Come, you asking that question like I've been shot at and that was less fearful than facing uh, uh, you know the deceased right uh, facing that experience which yeah. the emotional fear was way more top of mind and long lasting for me than right. like literally having my life in danger <laughs> I, that's weird I don't think I've ever thought about that till now well and and it's interesting and it's it's uh, you know not to you know hijack the shot I don't know if your listeners find this fascinating or not it, I mean it is for a lot us. of military listening and watching you so know, you know, I'm sure they can relate yeah li- listen like like depending on your unit depending on your you know if, if a, a lot of that is 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 timeline if you're if you're in a war zone you're slowly getting stress inoculated to you know shit. Because we know, were trained for that, yeah. And, and the, the, but also, you, you, I was trained you, for that. I you wasn't ex- trained you for the other shit. You expected We're sitting here exactly, right now. Yeah. If some rounds came through the window right now, yeah. we wouldn't be going, "Yeah, yeah, I've been shot at." Yeah. We'd be going, "What the fuck?" You know, yeah. and it, you know. Um, That's a really good point. Absolutely. But but it's but it's also you know it's the same things like when you go into a hospital, you know, like you start preparing for that mm-hmm. as you're driving there. You're like, oh fuck, like you know. For me, it began on know, the three thousand mile flight, right? You know, you know I'm preparing for walking into that. You know, yeah. but a lot of it is is, and that's why, and that's why I say fear throttles everything. And how do we use fear as a fuel to empower us? How do we consume fear, make it a consumable, where 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 we go? Okay, I just got a fear spike, and this is an energy in my body, and it changes with scenarios. It, 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 it could be yeah, yeah. like, like if I got to go do a speech and I get a fear spike, you know, how am I going to look at that and use that to serve me getting out in front of an audience versus yeah. okay, now I got a fear spike, you know, going to the doctor for a checkup, right. you know, what is, yeah. that's a completely different thing. And, and, but at the end of the day, what we can't have it do is because when you get a fear spike, you get stuck in what I what I coined the fear loop, and I've got this whole chart that shows you all the things. That yeah, we, I remember we talked about that in the last yeah, episode. Yeah. Definitely have to check that out. And uh, um, and I'll I'll get you a link to the graphic. You can stick it in the show notes awesome. if Thank people you. can do that. Yeah. But but the uh, but what it does is is it by it, sh- it shows you there, and and the thing about it is like, and what I love, you know, what I love about the whole no fear program is. 
you know, you, you made the joke or the observation, like, in, you know, this only applies to you if you're a human, right? Yeah. <laughs> right? But, you know, I started to tell the story and never finished it. Yeah. You know, uh, and it's funny how full circle, you know, my mom calls and says, happy birthday, yeah. right? And I'm like, yeah, mom, I'm only 58, then I'm 59. And then suddenly the idea of turning 60 mm. and then 60 becomes 70, becomes 80 and only, and whatever, you know, however much time we each have. And I, I got, I got depressed over it. Now that didn't change my output. Right. Like, yeah. you know, I was still writing like a monster, still seminars, still Zoom calls, still podcasting, still doing, but I was doing it with a, like with a weight vest on it was like i was doing murph yeah it was like i was wearing my 22 pound vest <laughs> like tighter on, parameters on, on all the time like yeah. why am i so tired today? it was because i'm because part of it is always thinking about ah and and here i am up in la and i see i see gary v and uh he hasn't started his workout yet he's on his phone his trainer's there and i politely walk over and interrupt and he's super cool shakes my hand says hi and like immediately i mean he's so fast we start talking about fear mm. in in business in life and he's like dialed into it and he talks about fear all the time yeah, yeah he's got a yeah. meme that says fuck fear yeah, yeah you know um and so uh we started talking about that we're going back and forth back and forth and then all of it, i actually did a little blog about this uh i paused and we talked for less than 10 minutes but it was, it was t to me, literally life changing. Wow. Wow. Because there's, there was a, like a momentary, like a pregnant pause in, in the little banter. Yeah. And, uh, I go, I turned 59 recently and I'm, uh, I forget how I said it, but I said, I turned 59 recently and I'm, and I'm not dealing with that. <laughs> like, like, well, and he, he said something like, you look pretty cool for a 59 year old. And I was like, you know, I, was, I was like in a bathing suit and you know, he looks at my tattoos. He yeah. goes, you look pretty cool for a 59 year old. Yeah. And without missing a beat, he looks me in the eye and he says, he says, you've got another 41 years to crush it. Yeah. Right. And it was all I needed to hear for him. He said a couple other things, but he was basically saying, are you thinking about living? Or are you thinking about dying? And it's like stuff that are, it's so obvious, but sometimes you, you need to hear it yeah. from an outside source. We need that outside and, permission. And the, and it was like, you know, that, that mentor moment where, you know, I just met the guy, but, but it literally, it was like a light going on in my head and it changed mm. that like instantaneously changed my relationship it's powerful. with wow. that. Yeah. It was, it was crazy because, and it's so, it's so simple, but it's, you know, like we have a course on multiple assailants. And I go, would you rather fight one person or three people? And everyone always goes, one. Yeah. And I go, well, three is easier. And they're bullshit. Well, at the end of the course, I'll <coughs> at the end of the course, I'll ask you the question. And people always go at the end, holy shit, I didn't realize that fighting <laughs> two or three or four people was easier. Because yeah. there's just yeah. something that goes on with that. But what happens is I go, listen, never let the math beat you. Hmm. That's one of the rules about multiples. So never let the math beat you. If you think, if I look at three people and I go, oh, that's three times 200 pounds, that's 600 pounds against 200 pounds. I might weigh by 400 pounds, that's six arms to two. Holy shit. I'm gonna, yeah, as seemingly opposed, the odds are against right. you. Yeah. So I was ironically like doing again with my own life. Yeah. <laughs> I wasn't applying the shit that I, <laughs> that I, that I teach. And that's a cliche, right? Yeah. But, uh, but it was a, you know, it was a magic moment, but it was again, why the fear stuff is so potent is uh, we all feel it. Yeah. E even even me who who studies it and analyzes it and coaches on it and lectures on it, um, you know, you, you you still deal with it, and we can still learn from each other and and everyone from uh, you know uh, uh, you 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 could you could get a life lesson from a homeless dude, yeah. you know, if you oh, have yeah. the conversation to Elon Musk or whoever, you just, you just got to be open and, and, and actually listening. Yeah. What would you say right now to someone who, because odds are someone's listening to this, they're, I would say on the treadmill or in the car, right? They're right. on the commute to and from work or somewhere, uh, or they're, you know, warming up in their workout or whatever. They're afraid of something right now in their life. Mm -hmm. They have us talking about fear for the past 45, 50 minutes 
has no doubt stirred up the thing that they are afraid of, the thing that they are not facing. Mm. What would you say to them, regardless of what they're afraid of, what would you say to them right now? How, how would they get to know fear right here, right now? So I created an acronym for fear and I'm wearing it on the shirt. And the acronym, people can't see this because we've made it discreet, but uh, <laughs> it's very you get a picture very of it. Camo. Yeah. yeah. What's it say? You can read it to them. F-U-C-K, fear. Yeah. Fuck fear. Fuck fear. So the F stands for face it. So the first thing you got to do is just go, and, and this is the peeling the onion part where I don't want to talk. How are you doing? You okay? Yeah, I'm good. Why? Well, your body language says it's not. No, no, it's okay. I'm, I'm fine. It'll be fine. It's nothing. You know, if you don't face it, you can never understand it. Step one is awareness. Yeah. Like in everything. And, yeah. and, and everyone has it, but they, they bottle it. Sure. Right. And so now I don't want to deal with that. Right. <laughs> well, and, but, but everyone does that. Whatever, whatever fear you have. So I'm, I am a fear management researcher, consultant, mm -hmm. expert, whatever the fuck you want to call it. Um, and remember I said, you know, you get doubt, you get hesitation, you get fixation, fixation becomes inaction. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And now suddenly you're not doing anything with it. So, and each one of these, if you, if you visualize, like you've got a fear, if you know, if you got like, uh, uh, like, like an issue on your, on your foot, yeah, that, that you hurt and you don't, but you don't want to deal with it. You're afraid to go to a podiatrist and go checks it out. And then it oh, turns it. Everybody better be not in their head. I'm sure they experienced that in life. Right. Like, but, but avoiding the doctor for something well, you but, should not be. Right. But, the, but, yeah. but, but that's, but that's so certain things, um, certain things don't matter. Obviously, if you could clear all fears, you obviously in the metaphysical sense, you self-actualize. Mm -hmm. I got no fears. I'm just fucking living. Right. But you know, that's, you know, I don't know that that exists. Right. And so there are things, whoever's listening to this, there's stuff that you are fearless about because you've been trained, stress inoculated, you've done the reps, you've experienced it, it and survived enough. It. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and, and, and you, it just, you have no, but there's 10 other things where if I said, Hey, let's go do this. You go, no, yeah. no, I'm not. No. Nah. And, and sometimes, sometimes they're, they're easy things to do, yeah. but, but so they're not, a lot of times when people are talking to me, they're like, it's like they're trying to think of life and death examples. Cause they know I'm like a self-defense expert. Oh, sure, right? Yeah. And I'm like, like, like we've been saying fear exists in a lot of ways, right? Very low end of the spectrum, right. very high end, you know? Yeah. It's, it's like how many people listening to this get anxiety if they're going to be late for something just like just, or just walking out of your house, facing the day, facing the world for some people, that would be horrible. And that's, yeah. that would be extreme, but yeah. there are, and there are people that I, I'm talking about just like normal that you think are like healthy, adjusted people okay. where, where, um, you know, you're, you're getting angry in a restaurant because the service is too mm -hmm. slow because the you know i always ask one of the questions we ask in our class uh how many of you are, always return food that's not cooked properly always mm -hmm. without exception usually in a class of 30 people two people put their hand up that means 28 yeah. people ordered their their steak medium rare got it medium well mm -hmm. and went mm, i'm not gonna return it and i go well why not well because i don't want them to do anything to me when you peel the onion yeah. they go yeah. i don't want anyone spitting in my food or whatever <laughs> you know and so i got lots of jokes to go with that but the idea is like everything we do in life you know, if I say, and then this fucking line just cut me off and stepped in front of me and ordered this, well, what would you say? Oh, nothing. I don't want to start any shit. I don't yeah. want to. Well, why not? Will you peel anything in life that you don't do that you know you wanted to do was subordinated to your fear, right? And so it's this, you know, this this movie in your mind that you start playing. So what happens is doubt becomes hesitation, hesitation becomes fixation. The movie in your mind starts mm -hmm. there. And while that movie's playing, there's inaction. Yeah, in other words, yeah. you're sitting there and you're going, don't do this, don't do this, this is going to happen. No, 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 no. All the while, life is passing you by. Right. Yeah. And so... Things and, might even be getting worse. And and exactly. And that's why what's neat about the this flow chart that I created is it starts with the scenario. So the scenario is you just plug it in. Is it yeah. a life or death scenario or is it a business decision? How many people do you know? You're, you know, one, one of your, your, your side businesses is, is consulting, uh, uh, personal trainers and gym mm -hmm. owners, yeah. right? Yeah. How many of them spent months or years 
in a job that didn't satisfy them, accountant, lawyer, uh, retail, whatever. And then finally went, you know, I'm, I'm going to quit my job and I'm going to be an entrepreneur and start my own business. Well, everyone does that. No, there's very few people that just go, I'm an entrepreneur. Like, like when they're 12, yeah. you know, some people, some, did, some, yeah. some did that, but most people, if they say, yeah, I finally, like after 11 years being an accountant, I finally quit my job and opened up uh, whether it was a CrossFit gym or martial arts studio or, or, yeah. uh, you know, a, a hot dog stand, whatever. I just want to work for myself. We but recognize it, that threshold or finally decide. To but it was fear. Threshold. Yeah, absolutely. That kept them where they were. So yeah. I can't emphasize enough that that changing a relationship with fear changes your 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 timeline of personal evolution. Yeah. And and so you know to go back to your question, yeah, directly, was that the whole acronym? Did we get all? Yeah, F- no, was not, that even, just F- not even <laughs> not even not even close. That was uh, they, got, they got to come to the seminar to get the rest of no the no. So leave them one and more. So yeah. the 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 acronym is fuck fear. Yeah. It's face it. And we just went off on a tangent because if you can't face it, the acronym means Nothing shit. Else matters. It's just a, yeah. yeah, it's just a cool it's just a cool shirt you can get to be afraid in, right? But the uh, <laughs> right. Um, so face it, understand it, okay. Control it, know it. Hmm. F U C K face, and so face it is self awareness and going. But it's not. You could be sitting there like on, like on the on on your toilet scrolling on your fucking phone, going like, man, I'm afraid to come out and and and. Uh, you know, go to this meeting or yeah. break up with my girlfriend or, 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 uh, just go back to my w- desk, w- yeah. you know, whatever. Yeah. And, and so you've got to face it first. That's the first step. A lot of times what we have is we've got this, 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 uh, almost idealistic learn from a movie or a book of how it's going to unfold as right. opposed to realizing your shittiest rep will be rep one. Mm. And, and, and so if it's something that is potentially like a recurring thing, like, as a um, as a business owner, I've had to fire people, and I always fired them one or two or three or four or five six months after I knew I had to. Yeah, right. Yeah, Be, right. Well, why yeah. didn't I fire them as soon as this, the, the nano moment you go? That person's not right for here. Like, why didn't you walk over and go, "Hey, come here, man. We want to give them another chance. We don't want to be." We're rationalizing. Bear no. bad news. Yeah. We're we're that's that's all the bullshit. Yeah on top of fear yeah yeah if you peel the onion you go well why why well they you know did i really train them did i give them a good chance if you actually as the owner went i gotta fire this person and i've done this Mm -hmm. and i'm the fear manager because all of those other factors are real yeah now the person he just got married or or you know she's you know she's trying so hard it's just not right it doesn't and so it's our our relationship connotation with 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 firing i don't be a bad guy and then and then Whatever the bullshit answer is, that if you follow the formula, you got a scenario and then you've got doubt. Yeah. Doubt becomes hesitation. You think too long about it. Hesitation becomes fixation. You start overthinking about it. That fixation becomes inaction. Inaction becomes, and this, this next bracket is situational or circumstantial. It doesn't always happen where you now have panic or anxiety. Right. So yeah. that would be like, you know, uh, uh, I need, I need to fire 10 people. I'm going to lose my company. Yeah. Right. And, 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 you know, something happened in the, in the marketplace and then, and and now you're like freaking yourself out, but you're walking in going high fiving every, everything's good guys. And the bank's calling you. Right. Or, um, (coughs) or you, you know, you, you get out of your car and then suddenly, you know, you pick up two guys following you and you don't do anything about it as quickly as you can. Mm -hmm. And that could turn into, you know, but most stuff doesn't turn into panic or yeah, right. or anxiety. Most yeah. stuff in our life is just this this like I call that the duress path, yeah. where you're going through life, but there's a slight amount of stress going on. Like the joke I made before is like you you forgot to take off your your weight vest after yeah. doing Murph, and you can't figure out why you're so tired <laughs> yeah. going up the stairs. You know, carry um, it with you literally. Yeah, you're just carrying. And so the, I, I I call that metaphorically during that part of the seminar the weight of fear. Yeah, because when you take it off, you're like whoa. You know, that, that feels different. And that's the only yeah. way to take off the weight of fear is to look at fear and make it work for you. Yeah. And so it's face it, understand it. And that's now the research. Okay, what do I have to do? But the thing I want to emphasize to anyone listening to this who may not get our No Fear program or come to it or hire us or whatever is, is that 
get out of your mind that the idea of if I decide to now uh, a- attack this fear and understand it, that it's going to be clean and 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 look like some orchestrated yeah, ballet it's movement. Yeah. It's it's not pretty. It's it's messy, and and in some cases it might be like you going through stuff. Uh, 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 crying, working out, hitting a bag, going for like like a run where you're freaking screaming on the run or yeah. whatever, just shit to get it out of your system. It depends what you're going through. Um, and then there's a lot of people here that can think back to things you hesitated, hesitated, and then you had a mentor that walked you through it. And at the end of it, they went, that wasn't so bad. Yeah. You go, holy shit, yeah. yeah. Like we all can think of times where we, we, we built up this dreadful experience and yeah. then it was like, that wasn't so bad. And sometimes that's it. I, I Again, personal experiences, um, I think why maybe I hadn't faced a lot of things in the past and why someone maybe right now is not, because it's scary to do that shit alone. But if you have a mentor, a friend, a family member, to just sometimes literally just being there is all it takes to just kind of have that that other presence to just walk you through and... We, and we have, you know, I have a guy who's a, cro- a you know, certified Krav Maga instructor who's been a psychologist for 20 years who came and got certified in our, in our self-defense. We have a train the trainer program for people interested in, you know, uh, bringing our research into their martial art or self-defense awesome. practice. But I didn't know this at the time, but he's a 20 year psychologist out in, in mm. Connecticut. And, uh, he calls me up about two years after starting with us and said, he's adapted my cycle of behavior to work with vets suffering from PTSD. And oh, wow. I actually interviewed him on our, our No Fear podcast. And he, he said, uh, it's amazing to hear him say this. He says that this program is way more effective than anything he's learned in 20 years of psychology. Wow. Because wow. The, the strip map is something that every vet can relate to. Like it's a simple like block map, like go here, if then go here, yeah. you know, go here. You know, there's no cycle babble to it. It just says, look, you're here. You got to get here. Mm-hmm. And that's very, say, you know, it's, it's Chase, you're here. You need to fucking get here yeah. and you need to be there by a certain time. We're not going to pick you up. You're that like, literally okay. boils down most of my military career. Right, right. It's like, it's like, you know. But here's that's, where you are. Here's where you need to be. Go. Right. Yeah. And, but, but is, that's life too. Yeah. Jam, I want to be here. Hey, I want to open a gym. I want to, I want to do this. I want to get married. I want to go on this trip. I need to save up money. You're here. You got to get to here. The, you know, so back to the, back to the acronym and, and, you know, if you, if you start to understand it, the hourglass is ticking. So yeah. the event is, the, the event is coming. It's your public speaking, starting a business, quitting, asking someone to marry you. And fear is creating this hesitation, right? The, it's, I got to face it. I got to understand it. So do as much research around it. And that, and that could, and I will you know, recommend people like, Hey, when you, when you study something, you demystify it to a degree, you, learn, you learn more about it. But a lot of people think, well, I read this article and then I took a private lesson and then I listened to an audio book. Mm-hmm. Why am I still afraid? Because that's not the experience. That's just now you're educating it. Like, and so, you know, if you're afraid of firearms and you do an armors course, because you misinterpreted yeah. what I said, you do the armors course, you're still afraid of firearms. Yeah. You haven't shot it yet. Knowing right? and doing are two entirely right. different things. You got it. You got yeah. to, you know, get some sort of practical experience without it being crazy um and then the c part of fuck fear is important because it's uh you've got in order to now do what you have to do you've got to control it you've got to harness it and that's the first rep Mm. now you you this may be an event you only have to go through once yeah yeah right um but it may be something where like you know, using the just the example of uh, you know your businesses are growing, you're going to have to fire people if you don't like doing it. At some point, you're either going to delegate it, yeah. <laughs> right, or you're going to get good at it. But that does. And here's the thing: is you, this, just because you're good at it doesn't mean you have to like it. Exactly. You can still yeah. you can still go, man. I feel really bad for this person, and I'm going to write them a nice resume letter. They're just not working out. But you know, I'm not going to pay somebody for three months while they drive me crazy because I'm afraid yeah. to do what I need to do. Yeah. So the controlling part doesn't mean, this is the whole thing is like, you don't ever drop the K and the W in no fear. There's no point ever in real life where yeah. I go, oh, now that I did Tony's program, I get to actually the original shirt, no fear. Yeah. You know, to me, that was, that's just a battle cry. You know, it's, it's, but it's, it's for most people, you know, I was just on uh, Mike Ritland's podcast, mm-hmm. awesome. uh, Mike yeah. Drop, yeah. and uh, three and a half hours, crazy. Wow. 
and man, can that guy cook. Uh, but, <laughs> but I will tell you this, you know, to his credit, you know, we're talking about that because I've, I've been around a lot of guys, uh, you know, former military or, or in there who, who have a, you know, they're, they're like the guy who's not afraid. And so you can't learn about fear management from people who aren't afraid. You get yeah. that a lot. And listen to this. There's a guy online. He's a, he's a cop. He's an MMA fighter, cauliflower ears, busted nose. And, you know, when he talks about people, there's, there's, there's a, a tone that comes out that y you, you can tell that he doesn't like a lot of other things. Mm. It's, it's, there's, a, there's an arrogance to it when he, he, he tries to intelligently put down other approaches. Now, you got to do this and this, and there's a lot of other systems out there. And, he, you know, even though I've been teaching military and law enforcement for 30 years, he did a videotape where he knocks our shit and oh, wow. tear, you know, tears apart the spear system and, yeah. and all that. And he, he's like, and I looked at it and people sent it to me and I went, you know, I don't want to take skydiving lessons from somebody who's not afraid to die skydiving. Yeah, yeah. I don't want to yeah. learn, like, understanding, understanding, I don't want to take self-defense lessons from a guy who likes fighting. Yeah. I don't want to take driving lessons from someone who is a demolition derby expert on the weekend. <laughs> Do you understand what I'm saying? It's like, yeah. like yeah. And, and this is the thing we, we, in, in the self-defense world, you guys, there's, there's, there's like the ads. I've been in 600 street fights. I'll teach you. No dude. That's I'm not like, trying to go seek it out. Right. Yeah. But, but, but there I don't are, want you to teach me that either. Right. But there are guys there that use that experience to elevate their status to naive people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I've been in a hundred fights and I was a cop and I did this and I did not go you like to fight. That's not what self-defense is. Self-defense yeah. isn't about learning how to fight. It's about learning how to not fight. Yeah. And having and having the courage. People don't understand that. Walking away from violence, any type of violence, emotional, psychological, physical, takes courage. To be courageous, you need to know mm -hmm. fear. Yeah. To be brave, you need to be afraid. Yeah, but like, I'll definitely have to link the, the original episode down in the show notes for everybody, uh, the Fuck Fear System Spear, uh, all your content. Just just Google Tony Blauer. You'll find some really incredible stuff out there. So thank you for your contributions to thank you. human race, really, uh, for helping us, a lot of people stay safe. Um, and like I was sharing with you earlier, really the origin of what I do and why I do came out of fear. It came out of me not facing it for a long, long time. And then finally recognizing to really to get to know it and be more comfortable with it. Uh, I literally had to put myself in the room with it. Um, and that to me is that really sums up a big portion of living a life ever for it. Uh, mm -hmm. really just not liking it, but just better understanding and being able to be in the room with fear. So with that in mind, man, how, how does Tony Blauer live a life ever for it? What does that mean to you? It it's, it's the serendipity of it is it's, it's a different way to look at our what, what's called the cycle of behavior, which is our strip map for fear. It's it's that, you know, the the arrows in the chart move ever forward. And they can kick back into the fear loop, but it's a visual going, hey, you're going the wrong fucking way. Mm, right? Yeah, we yeah. don't we that when we're in the fear loop, it's inaction. What we're doing is we're marinating in this horror movie in our mind. Most of it is you know, we're self-producing. Um, and so, you know, the serendipity of ever forward and, and really what I'm about is that you use every fear spike in your life as a moment to pause and go, okay, why did I get that fear spike? And what can I learn from that? How do I use that as a fuel, as a catalyst to explore it a bit more and then move past it? Is it, if it's a, a recurring issue, then I need to go through this as soon as possible. Yeah. And then I get yeah. good at it. And then when it happens again, you know, you, you're like, like it's a rep, you're stress inoculated and you go boom. And so everything there is you're always working capacity. And when you're working uh, capacity, you're improving your potential. And, and, and so things just keep moving forward. Absolutely. Beautiful, man. Thank you so much again uh, for coming up. Um, 
uh, I'm excited now to like be here yeah. more, uh, and definitely would love to check out um, a, a live event of yours, man. Maybe maybe I won't be the dummy next time. Uh, <laughs> no, let's do it. Yeah, excellent, man. Well, again, everybody watching, listening, uh, I'll have all of Tony's information listed down in the show notes and uh, in the comment box below. But uh, yeah, definitely check him out. Some great work on self defense and really getting to know fear, um, physical, emotional, spiritual. Fear comes in a lot of different ways. So thanks, man. Thank you. Thank you.